prefer to be in here than I do out of the videos. Yeah, I agree. I think it's better to be in person than watching the video. But then, you know, some people have been in quarantine, and so I guess it's good to have the videos for people who can't be here. And occasionally, like if you want to rewatch a spreadsheet thing, then having the recording can be useful. But I don't know. I really have mixed feelings about it, so. I'm going back and watch it quite a bit, but it, it, it does help a lot. Like, I miss, like, uh, some days mm -hmm. having to do something yeah. for at the house. And it, going back to watch the video without being in class is kind of difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so watching it, if you were there in the first place, it probably makes more sense than if you're just. Yeah. I see what you're saying. To me, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that you got in the. Uh, like you did a year of virtual school, right? Last year was mostly virtual. Did that make it so that from the rest of your college experience, you're just gonna kind of wish it was virtual still? Or like in the habit of not being in the room? Like what do you think are the long-term side effects of having done virtual for that year? For me, I really don't know because going into my first semester last year, I'd never taken an online class. I was just like, you know, that's not a good way for me to learn or at least that's how I felt about it then. So like, I mean, in some aspects, it does make some courses easier to understand, you know, more access to the notes and lectures, you know, because they're trying to make sure that you have everything that you need to be successful in the course. But I also like being, I like being in person better because there are some days when I was virtual, it's just like, I can't get with it to watch the class. Like I'd sign in, but I wouldn't pay attention to it. Yeah. And I'd, you know, that, that hurt me as I went on because you start you start saying I can watch stuff tomorrow and it piles up on you. So mm -hmm. I like being in person because it forces me to pay attention a little bit more or mm -hmm. I at least pick up more even when I'm not yeah. fully with it. Yeah. yeah then I, I can go back and piece it together. I it enjoy in person because there's something to be said for like having to get up and then like go somewhere else to do. I mean, you've already done something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, rather than just staying in your room all day. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's the routine that you kind of got into for 13 years, going you know from elementary school through high school. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was pretty excited at the beginning of the semester to finally be teaching in person again because it's so much easier when I can see if students look confused or I can see if they're actually doing the calculations. And I never had any of those cues when I was teaching virtually. It was just I was, you know, talking to myself three days a week. So I really prefer in in person, um, but it only works if people actually come. So I got to figure something out. Okay, <coughs> so um, you've got one more homework assignment, which is due uh, about ten days from now, maybe eleven, I guess, uh, Wednesday, the first of December. And uh, it's an assignment that has to do with a lot of the cost estimation stuff that we're talking about. And then on Wednesday and Friday of our last week in class, we're going to talk about taxes and depreciation. So uh, we'll talk about cost estimation today and then Monday after Thanksgiving. And all of that goes into the cost estimation assignment. So we're going to talk about two additional methods that are used for um, figuring out in advance how much things are going to cost. Um, on that homework assignment, I wanted to give you a couple of clues on um, which formulas should be used on what problems. I just got um, some consistent uncertainty in the past. And so we're going to see this equation today. And you use this equation on problem 7. And on problem 8, it is an index type problem, but it's not just related to the passage of time, but it's related to quantities. So these are both things that we'll talk about today, and it directly ties into the homework assignment you have due the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. By the way, you notice that there's an, annou there's an announcement missing that used to be on these slides about the project. So you're done with that probably feels like a weight off your shoulders. Um, there's 44 students in the class, and it's going to take me some time to grade those. My hope is that I have them graded by the end of dead week, meaning that you'll definitely go into the final exam knowing what your score on the project is, and you'll be able to see how that factors into your course grade. 
I'll spend some time during Thanksgiving break grading them. Um, so just keep your eyes on Blackboard if you're eager to figure out um, what your score is on that. And I hope it was a useful activity, you know. Um, personal finance can be pretty disorienting when, you know, if you've never given any thought to things like that before, and especially when you're looking at such long time horizons as 40, 50 years of your career and life. So the, the amounts become disorienting when you're thinking, well, my salary when I'm age 65 will be $550,000 a year, and that just seems like a crazy amount, but that's just the effect of compounding in so many years into the future what things will be like. So I hope it was useful. By the way, I don't know if you saw the email that course evaluations are open now. I'll give a reminder to everybody the week after Thanksgiving, but if, if you'd like to give feedback on the course, I mean, uh, I'm interested to hear what your suggestions are, you know, describe what you liked, what you didn't like. You know, there are several things I do in this class that are a little bit different from most classes at Marshall, like the in-class exercises and kind of the hands-on emphasis, um, extensive use of Excel, uh, the YouTube videos, and those are all innovations that arose out of student suggestions. And so I'd be interested to hear if you think that they're effective or if you have suggestions for ways that they could be adjusted to be even more meaningful or maybe completely fresh ideas. If you have any, please let me know. So the surveys are open now and you can get to them through MyMU. All right, let's talk about sewers. If you've ever flown over a, uh, a city, you may have looked down and noticed what looked like a bunch of odd swimming pools. Uh, these are definitely not swimming pools that you'd want to climb into. Uh, this is a wastewater treatment plant and ordinarily these wastewater treatment plants are pretty close to rivers. Um, in part it's because that's where the water goes after it comes out of a wastewater treatment plant. It goes into the river. Uh, but then it's also for practical reasons there because that's typically the low point in an area and that's why the river is there is because it's the low point and all of the water is draining towards that lowest elevation and so if you want your sewers to be able to flow by gravity then you have to put your treatment plant at the low spot and so all of the pipes that's carrying wastewater from people's homes and businesses goes to the treatment plant and then it goes into the river after flowing through the treatment process and so the main thing that we're looking at here, these are called clarifiers. And the purpose of a clarifier is for having solids sink to the bottom. And you can imagine what the solids are in wastewater. And things float to the top, like grease. And so uh, then they just draw off the water in the middle. And then the stuff that's at the bottom, the sludge, they pump elsewhere for treatment. The stuff that's at the top, the grease, gets separated out. And the, the water in the middle, still has dissolved pollutants in it and they send those into aeration basins. And the aeration basins is where they cultivate microorganisms that can break down the pollution in wastewater. They actually use bugs to purify water before it gets dumped into the river. And those bugs are highly effective. The wastewater will come in with a pollutant load of about 200, 300 milligrams per liter. And after the bugs are done eating that pollution, they're able to discharge the water to the river with 30 milligrams per, le uh, 30 milligrams per liter or even less. Um, so it's a, a really fascinating process that, frankly, I could talk a whole semester about. But what we're going to focus on is the size of things. This is a big wastewater treatment plant, but there are small ones as well. You know, not every city is large. There are smaller municipalities where instead of having so many clarifiers they'd have fewer and maybe they'd be smaller diameter instead of having a bunch of aeration basins they'd maybe only have a single aeration basin and so part of what drives cost is how much of something you're purchasing and we've talked about this idea in the past when we were talking about maybe getting discounts if you were going to buy a whole rail car full of sugar to make Twinkies versus if you're buying sugar by the single pound at Dollar General. The cost per pound is different if you're buying a rail car versus a single package. And that concept of a, a quantity discount applies pretty broadly. 
across a whole wide, uh, wide range of things that are purchased and constructed. So these cost capacity equations are a way for us to um, include that size effect in the cost of items. And so the cost capacity equation says there is some sort of a measure of the size, and that's Q. Q is how big it is. So if you know how big item number one is, and you know what item number one cost, and you're trying to figure out what is the cost of some other item. It can be larger or smaller. So item two, the size parameter, you would substitute here into Q2. And then there is an exponent. The correlating exponent is where you are able to account for the nonlinearity of pricing data. So remember how the cost per pound for a rail car of sugar is going to be less than the cost per pound if you're buying a, a single package. Well, if that wasn't true, if you're always paying the same price per gallon or per pound or whatever the unit is, if you're always paying the same price, then X would be 1. But if there is a nonlinearity, then X wouldn't be 1. If you have an economy of scale, meaning an advantage per unit for a larger size, then X will be less than 1. So if you're getting a discount for the more you buy, then you'll have the correlating exponent be less than 1. There are a few cases, though, that's called a diseconomy of scale. And so think about what that means. It means that if you buy a larger quantity or you're building a larger thing, then it actually becomes more expensive, not less expensive. So can you think of a, an example of something that becomes more expensive the more of it you buy? I can think of two cases, but I'm wondering if anybody else could think of other situations as well. What's something that becomes more expensive if you're buying a lot of it? Or it's not just that you're buying a lot. Think about the size of the item itself. Maybe you're building a bigger thing. Is there anything where the small version is cheap, but the large version is expensive? Maybe because the larger version is more complicated, or the larger version um, just needs more to get the larger one built. I'm thinking about a skyscraper. Think about a skyscraper, that, a building that's 10 stories tall versus a building that's 20 stories tall. The 20-story tall building probably needs a more sophisticated foundation. Um, it needs more specialized um, attention that's paid to the columns. Maybe the heating and ventilation systems are going to now be more complex because you have to have like pumps halfway through the building to continue pumping water higher. So um, it could just simply be that you know, it's going to be more expensive per floor. Like if we broke the cost of the building down to how much you're paying for each floor, if you keep getting taller and taller and taller, eventually the structure is so complicated that the, the price gets more expensive for each unit increase in size. So that's one example I can think of is high-rise buildings. Another would be if you're buying so much of an item that now there's starting to be a shortage of that on the market. Um, and that shortage is driving up the price. What if um, Apple made some new computer chip that required a very unusual rare earth element? You know, you've heard about the rare earth elements that go into all sorts of electronics and how the majority of those rare earth elements are mined and produced in China. Um, so what if there was some new material that they needed to put into computer stuff and uh, Apple was buying so much of it that there became a shortage on the market. So that's another instance where there could be a diseconomy of scale. So let's just practice using this formula with the following illustration. Uh, a treatment plant, a water treatment plant, that has 0 0.5 MGD. That means million gallons per day. That's how wastewater treatment plants and drinking water treatment plants are sized, is 
in terms of how many millions of gallons of water per day they can treat. So we know that one plant had a cost of 1.7 million and the correlating exponent is 0.14 so there's a pretty favorable economy of scale there. And we want to find out how much would a two million dollar plant cost. So it's, it's going to cost more than 1.7 million but it's not going to cost four times more. If it was linear, like if x was 1, then because it's four times as large, it would simply cost four times as much. But it, it's not x equals 1. Since x is less than 1, making this new plant four times larger is going to have less than four times the cost. All right, so let me pause for a second. I'd like you to get out a scratch piece of paper and do these calculations. Find out what is C2, the cost of the larger plant. take me a while to track it down. So Q1 is the, uh, the size of the one we already know about the cost data for. So Q1 is 0 0.5 MGE and C1 is 1.7 million and our correlating exponent X is 0 0.14. Q2, the size of the larger one is 2.0 MGD, which means if we substitute it into the formula, then C2 is 1.7 million times 2 MGD divided by 0 0.5 MGD, all of that to the power of 0 0.14. Okay, so what you should get for C2, the cost of the second item, it's going to be 2.06 million. Now this is a really powerful realization that making a treatment plant that's four times larger isn't necessarily going to cost four times as much money. Sometimes you can offer your client a much larger and robust and resilient solution for just a little bit more money. That's not always the case, but what you ought to do is explore the cost sensitivity of different sizes of a project. You know, if you're thinking about putting in a drainage pipe and the design calls for an 18 inch drainage pipe, then you can call the, the pipe supplier and see how much extra is the 22 or the 24 inch drainage pipe. And if it's just marginally more expensive, which is sometimes the case, then you may be getting a lot more capacity for just a little bit more money. So here's a table of some typical correlating exponents. This is just all for wastewater treatment plants. And there's data like this for a lot of different items that need to be constructed. This is just looking at what is the size to cost sensitivity for different types of things in a wastewater treatment plant. For instance, you'll see that most of these have a correlating exponent of less than one, which means the most common relationship is the bigger it is, the per unit cost gets smaller. I mean, it's going to be more expensive on an absolute basis, of course, but the cost per unit is smaller. So if we're talking about a chlorine plant, some equipment that is producing chlorine, they generate chlorine sometimes just from like salt. And so if it's producing chlorine, then the units would be tons per year. And the correlating exponent of 0 0.44 means that um, if you increase the size of the chlorine plant, it's going to cost more money, but it's not going to be a linear relationship, less than one. Uh, a few of these, though, are greater than one. Look at the uh, laboratory is greater than one. The same is true for a lagoon, an aerated lagoon, and sludge drying beds. And all three of these, the laboratory, the lagoon, the sludge drying beds, those are all space intensive. So in the case of a sludge drying bed, what they do there is they'll take sludge and they'll just spread it out over sand, usually, and then they'll just let the sun try to evaporate the water that's in the sludge. And so it becomes more expensive to construct a larger one simply because it's harder to get at the area in the middle. 
just the complexity of construction is greater when the size of the thing is bigger. So most of the things that, uh, that need to be purchased for any kind of a project will have some sort of a cost sensitivity relationship to size. So that's the first thing that we're talking about today. The next is the factor method. And the big idea with this one is that if you really need to make a quick estimate of how much a project will cost, oftentimes the overall project cost is simply a multiplier of one of the individual components. And so before we talk about the formula, let me just give you an illustration. When I used to live in Dubai, there's so many great restaurant options there. There's some really expensive high-end places, but my favorite was restaurants that had fantastic food but really low prices, and there's lots of them over there. Um, you could walk into a place, have a fantastic meal with like appetizers, multiple entrees, dessert, like specialty drinks, and it maybe would cost 10 or $12 a person. And you could eat for a king over there. Um, but you never really know um, sometimes by looking at the restaurant because there are some that just look normal that had really high prices. And those are usually by the beach or you know, like in the fancy downtown areas by the Burj Khalifa, but not always. Sometimes those expensive restaurants would be right next to a, a much cheaper place. So what I did was I'd sometimes just, instead of looking at the entire menu, I just immediately go to what do they charge for a bottle of water? Because the type of restaurant that I like, you could buy a big bottle, 1.5 liter bottle of water for about a dollar. But if you just look at the water bottle, and you, so I told you earlier that like a meal would cost 10 or $12. So what I learned in my mind is I'm going to spend about 10 times as much for the meal as the bottle of water costs. And so if a bottle of water is a dollar, probably my meal is going to be ballpark about $10. But there were some restaurants, uh, you just quickly look at the menu and the bottle of water, the same 1.5 liter is $6. And so there I'd know, okay, this is one of those $60 a person type restaurants. And you know, occasionally, rarely, I'd eat at one of those, but um, sometimes I, I could just turn around and leave because I looked at the menu that's posted outside the door and noticed the water's too expensive. So the same kind of concept holds here. It's like saying the overall total cost for a project is the cost of some individual component, C sub E, multiplied by some factor. So my factor was 10 bottled water to meal cost, the factor H was 10. But different projects have different factors. So here's an illustration. Oh, I already gave you this illustration. Um, let's uh, take a look at the in-class exercises for today. Let me pull these up. The first one has to do with cost capacity equations. And it's also, in the same problem, adding in the cost index. So we've already done a calculation on the whiteboard that used C and Q and X. But sometimes the cost data you have is from the past. And we've already talked about how we account for changes in the passage of time with cost indices. That's what we did in the prior class, in class exercise on Wednesday. So in this example, you need to um, figure out what is going to be the cost of a treatment plant in 2017 if we have all of this pricing data from 2010. So we know the size of each of the components and how much each of the components cost back in 2010. And we also know what was the index in 2010 and the index now. So here in this formula, I0 is the old index of 137. I sub t is the new index value of 164. And then the correlating exponent for an aerated lagoon, we can get here off of this table 15.6. So let's look aerated lagoon. Okay, here it is, lagoon aerated. So I'm going to write these on the board 
And that way you don't have to necessarily flip back and forth between pages on the in-class exercise. So let me put the uh, lagoon, aerated lagoon 1.13. The next item that we're going to have to include in our cost estimate is a blower. So here's blower 0 0.46. And finally, the third item that we're including in our overall cost estimate is a pump, a centrifugal pump. So let's see, pump centrifugal 0 0.69. So these are x values. So you're going to have to find out the individual cost components for each one of these items. For the aerated lagoon that's bigger, see the old one was $2 million. So the, the cost data we have is for a smaller item and for the past, for seven years earlier. So we're, we're correcting for two different things at the same time. We're correcting for the difference in size and the passage of time. So find the cost of all three of the items, and then the, uh, the total cost will just be the sum of those. So let me pause for a moment. Of course, you're welcome to collaborate, check answers, and all of that. I'll be circulating around if you want to check with me, and then we'll bring the solution up on the screen. Okay, very good. I think you've got the right idea. And it's pretty likely you'll see something like this on the final, um, where you've got both the passage of time and a difference in size that are being accounted for simultaneously. So let's look at the solution for this one. Um, here it is. We first have to calculate the cost of the aerated lagoon. Looks like that's about 12.4 million. And the blower cost, 733,968. The pump cost will be 13,490. Oh, I'm sorry, 291,000. So the total, adding everything together for the whole project, would be 13,490,000. And you should try to be accurate to the nearest dollar on these. Assume that your correlating exponent is exactly as indicated so that you, know, you don't just round off to the two digits of the correlating exponent. We'll consider that as exact 0.69. And the same is true for the index. Take the calculations to the nearest dollar. Any questions about that uh, first part of the in-class exercise? So that was the cost capacity and now the factor method is applying the idea that you can predict the overall cost of an item by the cost of its components and so um, let me share with you one other equation we talked about you could do it by just a single part of the cost but there's also direct and indirect factor component uh, costs. And so remember that direct costs are those costs that can be tied to the level of production. And indirect costs are those where it's tough to say for certain how much of a certain thing is required to produce a given output. So accounting services. You don't know how many accountants it takes to make an iPhone, but you do know how many um, like assemblers it takes to put together an iPhone. There's a direct relationship between some tasks and a less obvious relationship for things like advertising, insurance, and professional services. So all of those costs are wrapped up into indirect cost factors that are multiplied outside of the direct cost factors. So in the in-class exercise that we have, it is <clears throat> looking at the cost of a diesel generator. So a diesel generator will have a delivered cost of $975,000. So in, the, in this example, 
That is the cost of major equipment, C sub E. We also know that there are other costs besides just the generator. There's a concrete pad, and typically our past data tells us that pouring a concrete pad is about 39% of the cost of the diesel generator. So if you have a small generator, it needs a small concrete pad. A large generator takes a big one, but typically the ratio is about 39%. And then 16% of the generator cost needs to be set aside for operator training. So here, it shows you one plus the sum of the other direct cost factors. So if you think about what this is doing, the one represents the cost of the generator itself that's going to be multiplied by this cost of major equipment factor. And then the other ones are added to that. So one plus 0 0.39 plus uh, 0.16. And then it also says there's an indirect cost factor. So the indirect cost factor could be the fees associated with, you know, the dispatch of the delivery truck. It could be the people who placed the purchase order, um, the electrician who's going to wire this all together, you know, just things that we haven't yet accounted for in the direct cost. And so that's F sub I is the indirect cost factor. So find the total cost. The find the total cost of getting this diesel generator installed and, and operating if we know that the delivered cost is 975000 All right. So the major equipment is 975,000. <clears> then we add together all of the cost factors in addition to the cost of the major equipment itself, which is represented by one. And then the sum, well, the product of that is then scaled up by the indirect cost. So if you didn't have to pay indirect cost, this thing would only be 1.5 million. But since you have to pay a 27% indirect cost on top of it, it ends up being a little more than $1.9 million. Any questions about this problem? All right, so um, you know, if you find yourself really missing engineering economy during next week's vacation, you've got plenty of information that you could make good progress on that homework assignment. You could finish most of it this afternoon if you wanted to. There's just a, a handful of other things we'll talk about on Monday after we come back from the break. So remember the only announcement that you've got on your plate right now is that this homework 14 is due on Wednesday the 1st. So have a great vacation everybody and I will see you after next week.